Welcome to r slash nuclear revenge, where a cheating wife gets left with nothing. Our next Reddit post is from Tardinator02. Apparently, there was a thief who repeatedly broke into a Finnish man's cabin. The owner got pissed, so he bought some bear traps and put them across the inside of his cabin and left. He thought that the thief would be able to open the claws if he stepped on it. Well, the thief didn't get a chance. When the owner came back the next winter, he saw the thief dead on the floor with the claws around his crushed head. Apparently, when he broke through the window, he didn't go feet first like a normal person, but he dove in head first. The owner called the cops and they checked the crime scene out, and because the bear traps were inside his cabin, he didn't even get a warning. If they had been in his yard, it would have been a different story. I think it probably isn't the case that the thief dove in head first. It's probably more likely that he broke in at night and just tripped or stumbled and kind of landed and hit his head on the trap and then died. But either way, holy cow, what a miserable way to go. Having your skull crushed by metal spikes in a cold and desolate cabin out in the middle of nowhere. I have to wonder if this guy died instantly or if he was screaming into an uncaring forest for hours until he died. Our next Reddit post is from Throwaway. I found my best friend's wife's secret social media account. She was sleeping with one of our other friends. I told my friend about it. He just kinda shut down. A few weeks later, he told me never to tell anyone I knew she was cheating or that I knew about the account. I would casually ask him how the two of them were every now and then. Always great. Every time I saw them together, they were a happy couple. Nine months later, he confessed he had lost everything they had to a gambling addiction. A year before, they both had cars that were paid off. He had sold them and leased new cars. The money he made selling them, he quote, lost to gambling. Their savings and 401ks were essentially gone, all lost on gambling. The condo they lived in was rented. They had essentially no assets. She immediately filed for divorce. They had no kids, similar incomes. Divorce was finalized without him owing alimony. Her cheating was never brought up. She got all the furniture and pots and pans. He kept his secret hoard of gold coins. I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing it's at least $200,000 worth. <laughs> the only thing that would make this story better is if this took place right before that giant climb in the prices of gold that happened a couple years ago. Oh, wouldn't that just be the cherry on top if he screwed his wife out of her half of the savings and then later on when he sold the coins for cash, they were up to like 400 or 500k value. Our next Reddit post is from Asher Morte. Just a little background to start off. I was an exterminator for the better part of a decade and was only a few credits shy of a degree in entomology. Needless to say, I know my stuff when it comes to anything one might consider creepy and or crawly. With all this being said, I was a specialist for the absolute worst kinds of infestations. I treated for bed bugs, small cousins to ticks that only drank human blood. I bet you think you know where this is going, and just to cut you off, no, I never intentionally infested anyone. In fact, the revenge in this story isn't even for me. It was for what turned out to be one of the sweetest women I have ever met. For the purpose of the story, we're going to call her Mary. She was a nurse in World War II. I was called out to Mary's home by the management of the subsidized apartments she had, complaining about a small bug issue. What I found when I got there was not a small bug issue and it still haunts me a little to this day. When Mary answered the door, she was covered in bed bugs. Her hair, her clothes, even crawling on her hands. Without going into too much grisly detail about insect biology, this isn't normal. Bed bugs don't like touching human skin and they don't hunt when people are up and moving. This is why the bed is the most prevalent place to find them, and thus the name. 
I immediately called an ambulance, waited on them to arrive, and warned them about the very real possibility that anywhere they took her would be in severe danger of being infested if they didn't do something to decontaminate her. The poor woman was suffering from anemia, and it was luck of biology that she hadn't gone into toxic shock from the number of bites she had received. When she was rushed off, after having to be hosed off, literally sprayed with a hose, and having her clothes taken from her in semi-private, revenge mode started. Bedbug treatments are expensive, very expensive, and I had made a lot of contacts with local Department of Social Services and the Adult Protective Services because of the amount of charity work I'd done. Every single one of them got a phone call. Subsidized apartments have rules, including that they have to make routine checks. For an infestation to get to that level, it had gone unchecked for years. She had been being eaten alive for years. I called the local news, warned every neighbor, and collected statements about exactly how often the maintenance staff and management had entered the apartments. Once DSS and APS was done, I urged every single person who was put in jeopardy of the infestation to file civil suits, and recommended a lawyer I had done some work for in the past. He was more than happy to take the cases as a class action lawsuit. By the end, I had the manager of the apartments arrested for elderly abuse and neglect, and the entire staff from the top down fired. They had been falsifying paperwork saying they had been inside the apartment, performing routine maintenance, and generally scamming the government for services they didn't actually provide. I visited Mary for a while after that, checking in since it didn't seem like anyone else had in a long time. She was a wonderful person, and she never deserved to have to live like that. Her health recovered for a while, but time eventually came for her. I'll never forget her, or forgive the people that allowed it to happen in the first place. Oh man, that story was as gross as it was satisfying. Our next Reddit post is from Lady Guillotine. Back in 2008, I was in my sophomore year of college at a pretty huge art school in San Francisco. I was recently single, 26 year old female, and deaf trying to mingle with a couple of the 20 something dudes in my classes. New singleness also meant I was looking for some girlfriends to have single ladies night out instead of being the third wheel around the city. So I get a bit chummy with this girl in one of my classes who I'll call Monica. After that 90s Brandy song, The Boy Is Mine, a deep cut for you fellow olds. Monica is really talented at the same things as me and we have a similar fashion sense. We even have pretty much the same hair and makeup. We hit it off really well and started hanging out around the city. A month or so into our new friendship, I disclose to Monica that I have the hots for nerdy glasses guy in our class. I tell her I've been a little shy about saying hi, but wanted to ask him out for a drink. She acts nonchalant about it all. Next day in class, this hoe cannot stop gushing all over nerdy glasses guy and basically clinging herself to him. I'm like, yo, what the F to her? And she's like, what do you mean? All innocent. I probably should have just ditched that mess right then, but I was a naive and optimistic idiot. She hooks up with nerdy glasses guy and I'm like, eh, forget him. Some more time passes and we end up getting some drinks after class again. She asks me this time, who are you into these days? So I tell her I'm weirdly into no deodorant dude because his musk is kinda manly. This is true, but also a test. I have a feeling she's just a homewrecker looking to step in on every crush on my radar. Lo and behold, this moron Monica ends up hooking up with no deodorant dude a week later. I only found out because I actually got the nerve up to flirt with him and ask if he's seeing anyone. He says, Monica and I have a little thing that's new, or whatever. I was effing furious underneath the placid, calm acceptance. Meanwhile, another dude in our class and I have become art bros. I'll call him Burning Pisser. I'm not really into Burning Pisser in a hugging romantically way, but we hang out after class and work on art projects together. 
While shooting the breeze, he tells me his piss has been burning for a couple of days and he's probably got the clap again. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, the clap is chlamydia. He's a real piece of work and constantly cheated on his girlfriend whenever they'd fight. So he says they got into an argument and he went and passionately hugged a real hot mess. And now his dick is sick, lol. Of course, I went ahead and asked Monica out for drinks that very night. I gushed about how Burning Pisser was so hot. And I wanted to date him and blah blah blah. I really made it sound like I was about to have all his babies. I knew this woman could not resist. <laughs> Long story short, too late. She starts dating Burning Pisser pretty much immediately. Like within days. So not only has she slid into my crush zone, but she's home wrecking things for Burning Pisser's actual girlfriend. Look, he's no saint either, but he didn't go out of his way to steal my dudes. Anyways, time goes on and I cannot believe the drama explosion going on here. I'm getting the play-by-play -play from both sides and it was too good. Monica tried to steal him away from his girlfriend one night by moving into his apartment without asking. She arrived with a suitcase of her belongings and started setting up camp in Burning Pisser's place. Seizing the opportunity, he passionately hugs her like crazy. <laughs> oh god, how do I say this? Talks her into passionately hugging beneath an exit sign. And when he's done, has her suck his hugging apparatus. Hug to mouth. She tries to get into cuddle mode, but he's like, nope. Burning Pisser takes all her stuff out to his fifth floor balcony and throws it into the street. Suitcase, clothes, shoes, toothbrush, everything. Including the clothes she'd been wearing before they passionately hugged. So she's screaming at him. He's throwing all her stuff. And then his girlfriend shows up. She starts punching Monica and pushes her out of the apartment into the hall, naked, and locks the door to fight with Burning Pisser next. Monica does the ultimate walk of shame to pick up her stuff off the street and cover her dizzy butt before hitting home. Couple days later, Burning Pisser relates the story to me, then adds he went to the clinic. Yep, it wasn't chlamydia, but gonorrhea in his hugging apparatus. Monica tried to boohoo to me about it, so I just told her, yeah, I wasn't really into him. I just knew you'd passionately hug him if I said so, and I hung up. Not sure if she ever figured out where she got the clap though. <laughs> then we have this perfect comment from Magic Sparkles down in the comments. Slow applause, as in clap, clap, clap. <laughs> OP, I realize that this is r slash nuclear revenge, but isn't biological warfare against the Geneva Convention or something? That was cold. Our next Reddit post is from Deleted. This story was told to me by my friend's dad. He's a personal trainer and was training this guy in the gym who just got out of prison a couple months prior and told him his story. It spread through the prison like wildfire about this man who got what was coming to him. A man was convicted for raping and killing two girls, a five-year-old and a nine-year-old. He mutilated their bodies and traces of their DNA was found inside of them. This was the worst of the worst and the other prisoners found this out within the first week of him arriving. The man was only serving life but didn't get the death penalty. This angered the other prisoners who decided to take revenge. The prisoners started taking broomsticks from the janitor's closet and after collecting a few, they went into his cell at night. No one knew how the doors opened, but it was said prisoners had connections with the guards. When the doors opened, the prisoners went into the guy's room, gagged him, tied him up, and proceeded to shove 14 broomsticks up his butt, violently and forcefully. The body was found in the morning, bound and gagged. It was said that he bled out over a period of hours. A gruesome, painful death for someone who deserved it. 
How much of a disgusting human being do you have to be to make convicted felons hate you? That was r slash nuclear revenge. And in case you're not aware, I also have my videos available in podcast form. You can find the link to my podcast down in the description.